Why does this figure for three-fifths of the radian shown to us so clearly by Tikal's 178-foot-high Temple Three, vector itself on warm mineral springs? There's no mounds or pyramids there, just water. Is this perhaps the fabled Fountain of Youth, once sought by Ponce de Leon? There are thousands of springs in Florida, so when warm mineral springs answered the matrix, I wasn't particularly moved by it, probably just coincidence. To be sure, I ran the constants in the matrix over the coordinates of several dozen other randomly selected springs. Of the lot, only one answered. The Little Salt Spring, a few miles north of WMS. And of all the constants available in the matrix, Little Salt answered at four-fifths of the radian. Another radian fractional on a Floridian spring. What is this ancient matrix trying to tell us here? Well, we are not entirely without answers of our own. War Mineral and Little Salt Springs are known to rank as two of Florida's most important natural springs. And we know that they've been flowing generously for many thousands of years. Human remains have been found in proximity which date back 10,000 years. But was one of these springs the fountain of youth? Only they who have benefited from its waters can answer that. I must admit that their grid vectors answering the matrix at clear fractionals of the radian caught my interest. It also caught the imaginations of Floridian spring buffs, and soon other maps showing the state's springs were flowing my way. I ran their coordinates too, but they ignored the math. Until the day when the map for Mudhole Spring arrived. Mudhole is offshore, off the west coast of Florida, under 40 feet of ocean, yet its upward flow of water is so powerful that its position is actually marked on NOAA's map of the region. The site is well known by local fishermen, too. I ran its coordinates. Mudhole Spring answered the probe at a grid vector of 5.72957. That's one-tenth of the radian. And we have a third major spring vectoring the matrix at a radian fractional. But Fountain of Youth? I don't know. But I am drawing a theory that there is something remarkable about these watering spots, something the ancient cartographers deemed important enough to encode in their pyramid matrix system. Which poses another question. These springs are very ancient. And the fact that their positions answer the pyramid matrix indicates to me that they, along with other anciently known energy sites, may have been part of the reason this matrix was devised in the first place to show geomathematically their importance to mankind, in which case the pyramid matrix may have been mapped around them. For any who might care to double-check my findings with regard to these three springs, be careful of our maps. Present-day maps are still based on the 1927 North American Datum, or NAD. On such maps, coordinates in Florida can be off by as much as 100 feet. Correct them to our 1983 NAD. These are satellite corrections, and these are the positions which this ancient matrix answers. Do radian fractionals in the matrix show us things beneficial to us, to the earth, or perhaps both? Dare we ignore such communications? The ancients clearly understood. Now it's our turn. If the ancient masters did indeed incorporate the grid points 
of these important Floridian spring sites into a global matrix system involving their pyramids, long before the pyramids were ever built, then there has to be a way that the positions of these pyramids or allied monuments can explain from their positions. But which monuments are we to ask? There are thousands of them here in the United States alone. If you wish to learn information about springs today, you go to an encyclopedia and look underwater. The same is true in the Pyramid Age, except their encyclopedia consisted of a mathematical language. What do we have in the matrix which answers water? How about a mound which is surrounded by water? Like this one, the Shark Mound on North Bimini Island just east of Florida. It's called a shark because it resembles a lemon shark. The shark is made entirely of sand and is only a few feet high. But it is also 500 feet long, hence is of a respectable size. It is also surrounded by water. And as it is water we are trying to understand, let's begin with this artifact. Here we have its latitude and longitude the longitude being reckoned from Greenwich and therefore quite useless. Adjusting its longitude over to the Great Pyramid, we find it to be centered at 110 degrees, 22 minutes, and 53.55 seconds, thereby providing it with a grid longitude of 129,600, or in the language of the period, a square of 360 degrees. This, along with its grid latitude, gives the shark a grid point value or vector of two-thirds of pi. And? On the map, shark locates here. On the continent proper, one of America's largest effigy earthworks is this, whatever it is, at Portsmouth, Kentucky. Yeah, what is it? The only name it has in the formal record is Portsmouth Group A Earthworks, written in by Squire and Davis in the 1820s when they surveyed the site for the first time. Even then it was so ancient that erosion had cut several gullies across it. A 5,000 foot long what's it? The aboriginals made lots of effigy mounds in North America. Snakes, turtles, squirrels, birds, fish. You name it and they left it somewhere. But this thing. I have hiked and fished through the wilds of North America from the Catskills of New York to the White Mountains of Alaska and I can assure one and all that I have never seen anything walking, crawling, swimming, or flying that looks even remotely like this. And look, atop its central box section, it has a handle. Clearly, this effigy represents something that was anciently manufactured, perhaps a weapon of some sort. It even shows a curved indentation at its right end, as if designed to fit the shoulder of a hunter. Whatever it is, or was, this earthworks is worthy of suspicion. Why? Because it is only about 1,500 feet from a large river, the Ohio. Water again, and major water. So let's call this thing the device. Maybe one of the reasons we the people haven't heard much about it, beyond the works of Squire and Davis, is because there isn't much left of it today. Much of it is now part of Portsmouth. Buildings everywhere. But enough fragments survive to show up on a formal USGS 7.5 topographical map. So it hasn't been completely lost yet. To make a long story short, when we divide its grid latitude by its grid longitude, we find that its grid point value is exactly three. Having that, we add the device to our map.
Okay, so far we have a natural effigy and a man-made effigy. It's time to involve a pyramid. And the biggest one on the entire continent is that humongous heap of dirt at Cahokia, known as Monk's Mound. 1,037 feet long, 790 wide, and 94 high. But that's as we see it today. Originally, it looked more like this, and was a hundred feet high, a real monster, half again as long as Giza's Great Pyramid. They who follow my work have already been through monks, so let's get right to its grid point value, which is 1.047, or one-third of pi. Interesting. One-third of pi at monks, two-thirds pi at the shark, and a full three at the device. And, oh yes, the water aspect, monks is on one of the ancient flood terraces of the mighty Mississippi River. Okay, we add monks to our map. Good. Two effigies in a pyramid. What shall we involve next? How about the face? No, not the one over on Mars. Ours. The mile-long face at Poverty Point. After all, faces know things. We have covered Poverty Point in the original video, so let's get right to the point. It's grid point. The eye on the face, the misnamed Motley Mound, which also resides near water. Its value in the matrix, 1.909859, or one-thirtieth of the radian, another mathematical constant. Now, when we add the eye to our map, then join the lines from major monument to major monument, and then multiply their grid point values, one-third pi, two-thirds pi, one-thirtieth of the radian, and three, we find the constant 4 pi, 12.56637. Interesting. We moderns think of map grids being square or rectangular, not something that looks like a kite. But it is mathematically sound. Now, what do we do with it? The only common ground these artifacts have in nature is the fact that all four are near water. Maybe we need another water-bound artifact? And I can't think of a bigger one anywhere than Florida's 5,500-foot-long 5, panther mound in the Everglades. Remember it from the previous video? The mother of Giza's Sphinx. North Bimini Shark Mound was completely surrounded by Atlantic Ocean. Florida's Panther Mound is completely surrounded by the waters of the Everglades. What we do next is to switch mounds in the kite. We will dispose of the Shark Mound and replace it with Florida's Panther Mound. 